Well, hello, everybody. hope everybody's doing well. My name is Dave Linthicum. I'm the CTO and founder of Blue Mountain Labs, and today we're going to learn about the uh, new integration approaches in a cloud computing world. First, some gratuitous self-promotion. Uh, Blue Mountain Labs, we're leading the conversation with thought leadership and cutting-edge services in the world of cloud computing. Uh, great book out there, Cloud Computing and Silicon Convergence in Your Enterprise. Uh, do the InfoWorld blog on cloud computing and also have a podcast. About to hit uh, episode 200, so please uh, check us out at www.bluemountainlabs.com and uh, check content out as well. So the core issue here is that we're hitting a new frontier in computing. We're starting to move... Um, processes, compute services, uh, storage services out of the firewall onto the platform of cloud computing and it can be either public, private, hybrid, which is a mix of the two. So ultimately there are new integration pr approaches that are required. So cloud computing is about changing a lot of the way in which we do computing currently. So this is kind of a sea change in the fact that we're going to move some computing assets outside the firewall into the public cloud providers, you know, be the Amazon, Rackspace, Google, Microsoft, you know, whatever your brand uh, de jure is or all of the brands. And we need to figure out how to make this work and play well with our existing internal systems. So the cloud is causing a couple of things. Number one, it's creating value. We're able to do more with less, and it's much more effective and efficient than some of the traditional ways of doing computing. But it also causes the fragmentation of data, services, and processes. Because what we're doing, ultimately, we're removing out into cloud computing platforms, is we're relocating these processes, relocating the data, relocating these databases out into another area where they typically don't coexist with their existing internal systems. So we're creating new silos and fragmentations uh, of data and information and processes uh, within those silos and within the enterprise. We have to figure out a way to basically put the puzzle back together and allow our cloud computing based systems, private, public, or hybrid, to work and play well with our existing enterprise environments. Integration within the cloud is typically an afterthought as I'm finding. So in other words, they'll move data, they'll move processes, they'll move services outside of the firewall on some cloud systems, say Amazon Rackspace, and then ultimately realize that they need to synchronize that information back into the enterprise at some particular time, and then have to retrofit some sort of integration solution, either existing on premise or perhaps from a cloud, and to allow that information to be synchronized back to critical enterprise systems need to see the information. You know, for example, we're moving a customer service system out on to a cloud platform, say software as a service, and ultimately has to communicate with the inventory control system and has to communicate with the shipping, and those things happen to be on-premise. Has to be some kind of integration channel that exists between those two silos. And we need to figure out how to do that. Why we're building and planning for our cloud computing system, it's very difficult to you know, do this as an afterthought or something that we think about in the uh, the twelfth hour. So things are changing. You know, back in 1997, I wrote a book called Enterprise Application Integration, and that was about simple information exchange, adapter management, the ability to basically abstract the interfaces with source and target systems. Typically, it was within the enterprise or inter-enterprise. It's process focused, and it was dealing with the emerging use uh, use of services, but certainly you know, web services and some of the RESTful services we have today weren't available then. We were basically moving into standards at the time. We had lots of competing standards, but nothing really had taken, taken hold. So moving forward, 2003, wrote another book, Next Generation Application Integration from Simple Information to Web Services, which was the SOA book to update on the EAI concepts from the uh, previous years. And it focused again on simple information exchange. But now the use of services, RESTful and SOAP, and use of processes, use of federated integration technologies, and the ability to leverage transactions. And so the idea being is that we're taking integration to the next level, commoditizing a bit, not having to deal with proprietary interfaces as much, dealing with services, and therefore it becomes easier than it was in the past. Now focused on data integration in the cloud computing space, uh, use of service-oriented architecture patterns, we'll talk about that in a second, use of standards such as web services, use of open source technology uh, such as the uh, 
new OpenStack stuff and uh, the Eucalyptus stuff that's out there, and also movement into hybrid clouds, the ability to basically leverage public and private cloud services and provide integration, integration between. So what is the influence of service-oriented architecture? So service-oriented architecture is really kind of an architectural pattern while integration kind of comes along for the ride. And the, the assertion that I make is that ultimately, if you're going to build out these cloud systems that may exist outside of your firewall and make your existing systems work and play well uh, with these cloud systems, then you might as well leverage the architectural patterns that will provide that synergy um, as the end state. And service-oriented architecture is probably the best way to do that. Now, service-oriented architecture is different things to different people, excuse me, different things to different people. But it's really about leveraging services of, as ways of communicating at the, at the transactional service layer and the data service layer with multiple systems that exist within your enterprise. In this case, may exist outside your enterprise on the platform of the cloud. So we deal with data abstraction, data services, transactional services, you know, process, process orchestration and composites, the ability to basically bind services together to perform and reform solutions, and the ability to do monitoring and event management to monitor the health of your system going forward, and also with a big healthy dose of governance or the ability to control access to the services and access to information, and then also security to make sure we're, we're adhering to privacy and compliance issues around our security infrastructure. Service-oriented architecture challenges are, you know, fairly known at this point. We've been doing this for well over 10 years. It's technology, you know, interoperability issues, maturing product lines, evolving standards, temptation to use proprietary features. It's people, awareness of buying at all levels, adoption of new ro roles to learn processes and new products, working on shared environments, and then processes, so a governance, the return on investment on service-oriented architecture, you know, funding, service identification and metadata management. So lots of moving parts exist within a service-oriented architecture. The idea is to under, wrap around, get your arms around this complex environment and make sure there's a systemic change and kind of a sea change within, the, within your enterprise as you move toward a service-oriented architecture, which will enable you to easily move to a cloud computing environment with synergy between all the source and target systems, cloud or not, using a very well thought out built-in integration strategy. And that's kind of the core focus of this presentation. So I assert that you start with the architecture. You need to understand your business drivers, the information under management, the services under management, and the core business processes. Now some of these things may exist in pre-built applications. I hear that a lot. We don't have control over it. We don't have the source code. We're buying this from SAP or a CRM vendor or something like that. Perfectly fine. You have to understand the interfaces into those applications, how services can be exposed, and also the innate behavior of those applications as well as the information that's under management. So some of your systems are customized, custom built. Some of your systems are bought off the shelf, you know, COTS applications. Uh, some of the systems are basically a hybrid of the two, maybe extending, um, you know, certain functionality on top of existing proprietary stuff, you know, so, you know as such as SAP and the ABAP stuff that's out there. So we need to get a holistic view of what the existing enterprise architecture is before we can actually make the movements or the migration into the target state use of cloud and then re and then define the integration pass as we uh, pass as we do that so i also assert we start with the data you know understand your metadata understand your data abstraction layers or how you're going to remap the data into something that's more adherent or aligned with the business understand your data services definitions and how these things occur and basically a complete semantic understanding of the problem domain that you're dealing with. And we're doing this because we can't integrate information that we don't understand uh, in between these various source and target systems. If you do that, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to pull the wrong customer data, wrong transactional data, and move it into the wrong system. So we create something called a common data model or a common metadata understanding of the particular problem domain. And by the way, a problem domain is not your entire enterprise, especially if you're a global 2000 company. It's a small bite-sized problem domain, typically less than six systems, and less than about, oh, a thousand data elements under management, as a rule of thumb. So the basic concept is one can consider cloud computing the extension of service-oriented architecture out to cloud-delivered resources. That's where we're going. The, the trick is to determine which services, information, and processes are good candidates to reside in the cloud, as well as which cloud services should be abstracted 
within the existing uh, existing or emerging service-oriented architecture. So we work at these layers, the existing application, the resources, the components, the services, and how we're going to orchestrate the services together to form and reform the solution. So how do you get things done? Well, here's the checklist. Uh, cloud providers must integrate with existing enterprise systems in order to become more valuable. So that has to occur. Typically, the cloud providers aren't going to provide you with the uh, integration solution you're looking for. You have to create it yourself. So existing internal integration needs, ex uh, needs uh, you know, basically um, need to ensure that production and consumption of structured information is done correctly. There's semantic and mediation. In other words, we're dealing with the differences between the source semantics and the target semantics. We're mediating the differences in security between the source and target systems, and that could be one-to-one, many-to-many, or one-to-many, or many-to-one. Uh, deal with the service enablement, or basically how we're going to enable, govern, and manage the use of services. We need to deal with firewalls, because obviously some things can't punch through firewalls. Some things aren't porn data compliant. You have to figure those things out if we're moving out into a public cloud environment. Need to deal with transactional integrity of the various systems, unstructured data as well as structured data, and the holistic management of the complete integration chain. So not much to do. Actually, very complex things to do. So a lot of things, uh, complexity that you know I raised in the first book back in you know 1997 are still around today. We just have better technology that we're able to apply to solve these problems. So more rules of thumb. Uh, Remember, you know, you have to deal with semantic and metadata management. You know, that has to be core to this and how you're dealing with the semantics or the metadata within the source and target systems and understand how the integration occurs between the source and target systems as you deal with the information as well as the services. Transformation and routing has to occur. Accounting for the differences, uh, for the data differences during runtime. Uh, you need to deal with governance across all systems, the ability to basically understand where the source information is coming from, where the target information is coming from, and how all these various services and interfaces abstract into a common metadata layer and how that data and those services are governed. Uh, either at an active governance system where actually there's a piece of software that's monitoring and dealing and allocating those services to the appropriate people who are authorized to leverage them, or a passive governance system where basically you're just keeping track of who's leveraging the services and leveraging the data. Discovery and service management, meaning how you find and leverage the services, those things have to be in there. Once we take the services, they go into a registry or repository. We're able to search on that registry and repository, discover services, bring them into our composite application, bring them into our processes. Information consumption, processing, and delivering. Delivery are how, effectively, how you effectively move information to and from all interested systems. Uh, connectivity and adapter management, how you're going to connect into these various systems and any kind of uh, interface uh, abstractions that you need to deal with as you communicate with source and target systems, say proprietary enterprise uh, uh, applications or even uh, traditional databases. Process orchestration and services and process abstraction, the ability to abstract the services and information flows uh, into bound processes, thus creating ultimately the solution you're looking to create. So you can a basically take these processes and orchestrate the integration, and then you can reorchestrate the integration, reorchestrate the integration over and over again. That gives you the agility value of service-oriented architecture, the ability to define the invocation and the sequencing of, of how you're going to leverage sets of services that you're able to redefine through a configuration process rather than a redevelopment or recoding process. So. Show us some love. If you like this presentation, you know, send me an email at david at bluemountainlabs.com. Make sure to um, you know, give us the thumbs up down there if you like it. Also, keep in mind that Blue Mountain Labs is product agnostic. We don't sell hardware, software, or managed services. Holistic approach to architecture and planning and execution. Unlimited options for the right solution. Expertise in development of cloud applications, enterprise architecture, service-oriented architecture, and cloud integration solutions. Understanding belongs in the cloud on the and on the ground, on-premise, key relationships experience uh, with uh, who's who in the cloud, manage managing risk um, because we have the best, your best interest in mind. So if you're looking for a trusted advisor, someone who can assist you in moving to the cloud with the objective advice looking at for you, you know, please make sure to check us out at Blue Mountain Labs. That's www.bluemountainlabs.com. Thanks, guys. Look for the next video.